I felt that any prospect who was either misleading me, blatantly lying to me, or just trying to manipulate me to give him information or be column fodder or whatever it might be, is taking time away from my family. So mm. actually, they're stealing from my, from my children. Hell yeah. <laughs> I like where you're going. Keep going. So welcome everyone to this month's Fireside Chat. Uh, I'm excited today because we have a, a secret um, seller that has not going around and publishing, you know, sales guru tips online or writing books. He's out there in the field selling more than most of us have ever sold in our career. And his name is Dive In. We got a lot to cover. Um, why don't you start by giving us a little bit of your background? Just how long have you been in sales and maybe how, how did you originally get started in sales? Sure. So uh, I've been in sales for about 25 years, uh, almost to the almost to the exact year. Uh, and I got into sales. Uh, interesting story. So I started my let's just call it professional career in the process control business. So I was a field service tech. Uh, mm. I was in the military for six years. I got out. I worked went to work at a power plant. Uh, I was implementing control systems there from taking them off the old mercury meter systems from the 50s and automating different processes and and boilers and uh, water systems and turbines and things like that. And one day a field service guy came in and and he was uh, he was called in by someone and uh, he knew less than I did. And I I asked him, how much money do you make? And he made about a third more than me. And I said, can I get the, your your boss's number? And so I called him and I spent about nine months as a field service tech and it was brutal. I was doing startups, uh, basically working six, seven days a week, uh, sometimes 18 hours a day. Uh, it was just crazy. And uh, naturally I got burnt burn out. So I was looking for a way out at the time. There was a field services manager job that came open for the territory. And I had, they gave me four engineers and a, and a patch of New England. So it was up to me to uh, to either uh, keep my engineers busy with projects that were being sold to the sales guy or sell projects myself. And we had a very underperforming sales guy. So uh, I basically was my own demo guy. I, uh, I had a cost center. I could you know spend money uh, back in the old days uh, in the 90s when they really took care of managers. And I uh, basically did whatever I wanted. I would travel around New England. Uh, it was getting close to a couple of years before Y2K. Uh, I had a deck alpha in my in my company car with a 21 inch monitor, and I would hump it around and show it show the new systems and software to these power plants that were running on 70s equipment. Uh, inevitably, I outsold the sales guy, and I had to do it. And and doing so, I was able to scale up from four to 16 people in about three years. Mm. And we were doing crazy things. I hired really super smart engineers that were way smarter than me and we just did amazing things. So at one point, the management team came to me and said, we want you to be in sales. I had a concern uh, leaving uh, a billable hour job going into management uh, because it's, you know, there's uh, sometimes not being measured necessarily by numbers. But uh, I figured out a way to hit all three metrics, which were uh, top line revenue, margin, and utilization of, of the people. So I'd manage my own projects, I'd keep them billable, I'd go out and send them to training while they're billable to pro my projects. So utilization was high. Uh, I got great discounts from the company and to resell to hardware to the and software to the to the to the power plants. And and so I was in total control of it and it worked out great. So they said to me, we really want you in sales. So I, I jumped in and I only spent about a year there in sales and the company got acquired and everybody, a lot of people left and one person went to an enterprise software company. So I wasn't making a lot of money back then. Uh, you know, everything was pretty much under a hundred thousand. And uh, when I went to the software company, an ERP company called Ross Systems, it was a uh, interesting change. And uh, from there, uh, it was the home run through several different software companies. I spent eight years at Ross. I spent some time at Oracle. I spent some time at Infor, and then at a at a uh, implementer of uh, a partner of Microsoft that then got acquired by RSM. And I've been here for about twelve years. Awesome, man. So you've you've had quite the run. You've had a lot of success, and it's interesting because one of the um, people I worked with at Salesforce, she was making consistent income near a million dollars every year. And she was an engineer 
And she didn't strike me as a traditional stereotype for what you think of as a seller and, and some of the qualities and the personality traits that she had. And I'm curious, kind of what are the qualities that you have or what are the traits that you possess that have made you successful in kind of making that transition from engineering field field service to sales? And why is that maybe different than what people think is is needed for success in sales? Sure. So I think it's really uh, having the passion for what's being sold. Uh, you, you really can't, as a salesperson, can't be an expert. I'm no longer an expert uh, on what I sell. Uh, and it's really diving into the complexities of, of what you're selling. Uh, my view is that, uh, and I learned early on that the more complex the machine or software you're selling, uh, the bigger the companies you're selling it to, the bigger the projects, the more money you're going to make. So I was always trying to navigate my career towards uh, the target market that was much bigger, higher, bigger enterprise projects. And uh, I think part of it was my interest in, you know, the complexity of manufacturing and, you know, I had you know, experience in process control and, and fixing things, uh, you know, the military pounded us uh, with, you know, troubleshooting techniques and capabilities. And then once I got into ERP, the first thing I did is I read five or six books on ERP mm. uh, to know how ERP works. And, uh, and that was immense. And I tried to instill that on everybody that I'm working with is it's not just about sales or understanding, you know, kind of how the, what, how the product's priced or how people want to buy it. It's really what it does. And I'll give you an example. Uh, it, knowing how it works, uh, you can avoid going down rabbit holes that you don't need to go. Uh, I had a call a couple of months ago where uh, I was a distributor and I asked them, they told me they had a product configurator. And I said, you have a product configurator, but you're a distributor and you sell components. So I theoretically could have gone down the path of this product configurator need, uh, knowing that the product I'm selling has got a configurator, but it's not terrific. So we might need a third party. I have to draw someone else in, add about $300,000 to the project, spin up a whole team around that. So I drilled in a little bit to really understand what a configurator meant to them, and they didn't need a configurator. So having that knowledge of what you're selling, even though you're not the person implementing, uh, is is really critical to to not only bonding with the prospect, but you know avoiding pitfalls. Mm. Okay, so one quality would be knowledgeable in terms of not just the products you sell, but how they help the client in in the general category of the general industry. And in, in your case, ERP. What other qualities or character traits do you think you possess that just make you consistent year after year? So I think competitiveness. I think everybody thinks that way. Uh, my first interview for sales, my first sales job, the fellow interviewing me is, you know, he must, he must have been selling in the, in the, so this is like, you know, late nineties, he, he was selling in the sixties. So he's got this old school mentality. And his first question to me was what sports do you play? And, and so he wouldn't hire anybody who didn't play competitive sports. Right. So it is being competitive. And, and I turn that competitiveness into really a family oriented competitiveness. So I felt that any prospect who was either misleading me uh, blatantly lying to me or just trying to manipulate me to give him information or be column fodder or whatever it might be is taking time away from my family. So mm. essentially they're stealing from my, from my children. Hell yeah. <laughs> I like where you're going. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean by that? So you're valuing your time and I, I want to be, I want to dive into this a lot because I know you have a 75% win rate. And there's a reason for this, but talk to me about like early on, how you know if they're stealing your time, if they're shopping you, if they're not serious, give me kind of how you actually assess that and, and, and do a sniff test for it. Like, what does that look like for you? Yeah, so I think that there's a, a lot of, uh, you know, personality or, you know, communication traits that exist where, you know, somebody's really being genuine with you or they're, or they're deferring when you're asking them hard questions. You know, how open are they being? And uh, how much access are they giving you? How, how, uh, how much are they willing to uh, meld to your process, to not skip steps uh, and try to you know, kind of cheat the process? Um, I look very closely at competitors because you're always competing on price no matter, no matter what. Uh, and where we have, you know, where there, a lot of times companies don't want to tell you the, don't want to tell you the budget. 
right? So in lieu of asking the budget, which I essentially never do, uh, I uh, ask them who are my who I'm competing against. And if they don't want to tell me that, I will drill into scope, understand what that scope looks like, how big the company is, what features and functions that they want to use, you know, where they're going to use the system. And I've been doing this long enough where I will tell them what I think it will cost in the initial call. Mm -hmm. So I will qualify and price day one and I won't wait. I mean, and if you can't do that, then, you know, the other answer is, is to take all the information offline, work with your, you know, your engineering team or whomever they might be implementation team and get that number and give it back to them and get them to validate and get them to take it to their management before you agree to do more work. Okay, so your assessment is basically, it's a big job, just so we're clear, you're looking at somewhere in this range, I just wanna be transparent with you to see, is this the way you're thinking about it? And if so, before we go invest the time, we get the right people involved? Is that kind of a right. good, right. good summary? Right. And, and what happens most of the time when you when you do that in a early first, first meeting, for example? Well, okay, there's a couple other things too. Um, I'm also qualifying on industry, qualifying on references, qualifying on functionality. Uh, and uh, I will you know, present the case to them right there and then how what the fit looks like. Uh, I have uh, often we get told to to go away or they're not prepared, right? I ask them what the requirements are and they say, you know, I had a call a couple of months ago and the person said, we don't have requirements. And I said, well, uh, you're going to need requirements for me to help you out here. And he said, I thought you would do that. And I said, well, I can do that, but I'll engage my management consulting team to do that for you for a fee. And he said, oh, I really don't want to do that. I said, great. Why don't you get back to me when you have your requirements? Right. So I, I don't, I don't spend any time with people who, you know, are just trying to use me for free consulting. What's your, what's your general, like, it, it sounds like a mindset of like, I value my time so much that I don't want to waste it with people that aren't committed. And I honestly share that exact same mindset with you. I, I share that. I would go into people and say, I'm going to bring in my team. I'm going to bring in resources. I'm going to give you everything I can, and we're going to do great work. And I expect the same from you. So here's what that looks like. And I'll walk them through my process. And if they're not willing to bring in their team, go through the process, I'm not going to waste my team. It's not just my family's time or my money. It's it's my engineers. It's my well, peace. Yeah. And here's the key is that uh, when I see my role as basically an intermediary between the prospect and the team, uh, and the team may be large. Uh, you know, there's there's projects where in the pre-sale environment, we've got seven or eight, nine, 10 people. We've got a data digital group involved. We've got a risk management group involved. We've got management consulting and we've got the ERP folks involved and, and maybe CRM uh, field service. And it can be huge. And so uh, the more you waste other people's time, the less likely they're going to want to work with you the next time. So I have the reputation of if I ask you to work for me, they know they don't even have to have, have to ask the questions. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. So your role you see as an intermediary. I mean, what do you kind of let's talk about enterprise selling, strategic selling, where you have a team where it's you know, a lot of resources that you're putting in for large transformational deals. Um, what do you, how do you define the role of a seller in that type of capacity, account director or above, either at a SaaS company or at a services company? How do you think about the role? Well, I, I think it, it's really about the, uh, almost like a project coordinator, right? Mm -hmm. Selling, you know, a large deal as a project unto itself. And it's got many steps and every step needs to be controlled, measured and defined for success. Uh, and uh, it, it has to involve lots of prep, uh, you know, documentation, uh, uh, putting a, up a repository of all the information, making sure everybody's reading it before they're engaging, you know, all the prep calls with people to make sure they're on before they join calls or meetings with the prospect. They're not asking, showing up to a call and saying, are you a public company? Right, it just drives me crazy. Right, uh, they should know, they should know everything that I know, and uh, and also measuring six, making sure that you are getting the measurements for success at every stage, uh, whether it's uh, discoveries or or certainly demonstrations. Right, you know these can be complex, long, multi-day situations, uh, and you know all the way down to references. So when somebody asks me for a reference. 
uh, I won't give it to them unless I know I'm, you know, basically selected. When, when I laugh when people ask me for a reference up front, uh, it's just not even a thing. And um, and I also don't don't uh, you know I don't present logos. A lot of companies will you know they present this is my company, this is my practice, these are all the customers that I work with. I don't do that because I feel I'm so good and my my firm is so good that I don't need to tell you who my customers are. Mm -hmm. And I have been doing that for years and it's very successful. What I'm seeing is a very outward seller, the way you're talking. You're not worried about proving your worth. You're not worrying about, you know, selling at all. You're worrying more about who can we help and make sure you are the right fit for our team because we're going to do good work. Does that that's, actually describe? Yeah, that's right. And, and then all the way down to the reference call, right? There's a lot of, you know, some companies don't, you know, some businesses don't have to do references where I'm in the business where it's pretty mandatory most of the time. Uh, I've actually gotten away uh, often without doing references, which is my kind of my ultimate goal and uh, kind of have a reputation for it. And why, 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 why do you not want to give references out? Is that just an ego? The variability. Okay. Uh, not only do you have to, you're asking for a favor from someone. It's a favor that you, uh, you know, I collect my own references after all this time. I, I have people, I have clients that I've sold five or six, seven years ago. I have monthly calls with them. I don't do any business with them because it's now an account manager owned account. I'm not, I only sell net new, but I nurture those relationships because I know the reference is everything. And I get on these calls monthly with these people and we don't talk about work. We mm -hmm. talk about our personal lives. I make friendships with these people. So when I need a reference, they're going to do it for me. So when I do the reference, I tell the prospect that they need to tell me everybody who's going to be on the call names and titles. I want a list of questions that are going to be asked. And I want a, a list of success factors that they need to see in the reference call before we execute. I share that with the pro with my client and I say, can you do this? And I need an affirmation that they can. I also do, always do a prep call with the, with, the, with the reference beforehand. We're on the same page. So they never fail. My view, a reference call is an idiot test. If you fail that after you've done all the work, right? It's just, it's mind boggling. Yeah. So you said you, you only sell net new. I'm curious, do you do you reply to RFPs if they're not giving you any discovery or access or any kind of, because you're in the business of, I mean, big projects from Microsoft and these aren't like, these are competitive. People will shop, you know, implementation partners and SIs and the like. Um, what's your kind of like, how do you, in these net new situations where you're competing, it doesn't need to be RFP per se, but like, how do you win 75% of net new when these, these competitors often are cheaper than RSM or they might look the same on paper in terms of the scope of the services? How are you winning 75% of your deals? Well, we never answer a blind RFP. That never happens. And we always force proper discovery. There's no way that you know we would we would I mean, let's, really, let's pause let's pause there you don't answer it you just don't reply you say i need to stop or yeah. we won't reply like what is yeah, the process just, for when you get an rfp what do you do to you know yeah, if it's a blind rfp uh i would need to really drill in deep with and generally blind rfps mostly come from consultants so uh, you really have to dig in there and there's some consultants who are more friendly uh, versus others i mean if i've known them it's okay if i don't know them it's 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 something you know that uh, it requires a lot more vetting, uh, but I generally don't respond to blind RFPs. Okay, so you don't reply, which I agree with. I I, don't, I can't think of an RFP I won a blind one in my my whole career. Yeah, um, for that reason. But what do you do in regular where it's not an RFP to differentiate where it is competitive, knowing it's new logo? Kind of how do you how do you stand out sure. in those deals? Sure. And, and my view of of all of this is you win at every stage. So I'm going to do the best RFP. I'm going to do the best discovery. I'm going to do the best demo, right? And the RFP is, uh, we've got a, you know, fortunately, well, I'll go way back in history. Uh, my first big ERP deal was with Borshead Provisions. And I was month two with, with the company. And I, we were, you know, we knew the RFP was coming. I did it. I spent all of 4th of July weekend putting this RFP together by myself. And I coming from a process control industry where, you know, there's, you know, projects are big uh, and the RFPs are very complete and they're very, they're thick. So that was what I thought the standard was. So I did the RFP, 
sent it in. Uh, we met in Brooklyn, New York, the CIO at, at uh, Boar's Head puts his hand on the RFP that's sitting on the desk and he said, this is the best RFP response I've ever received, right? And I was in month two at this organization. So uh, I, winning at that step for sure, being you know absolutely complete and thorough and, and I'm fortunate enough now to have a team. Uh, we have a proposal team and we have an implementation team and we have all kinds of people who are gonna contribute to that, uh, proofreaders. And so, uh, you know, that's the, the key is doing it right. Okay. Well, besides doing good RFPs, where do you stand out in discovery or early on when you're competing that you think is, is, is your kind of superpower? Sure. Another, another old example. Uh, I was walking around a plant, uh, and this is back in 2000 coming from the process control industry. I knew a lot about connectivity of machines. So I was walking behind the scales of the in the in the uh, production facility and looking at the ports of the scales to see what their you know their Ethernet or RS232 or whatever it might be and and the services guy who was doing the discovery with me was very salesy so they confused us they thought I was the implementation guy because I was looking at machines and I thought the implementation guy was the sales guy and so they they recognize who's doing the deepest discovery and who knows most about their industry and companies like them and who's doing the most work. So we always say we win at discovery. So it's, it's that, yeah. again, you're winning because you're you. I want to be really clear. I've, I've worked with, coached, and now um, watched thousands of sellers and the common top sellers are all doing the same things. They're all doing exactly the same things. They might have different personalities, but what you're talking about is deep curiosity to mm -hmm. understand their business and see how and where you can, you can help. You know, uh, other things, I read annual reports. Uh, annual reports are horrible. They're 100 pages long, but I've learned how to read them. Uh, how why to not just throw them into chat GPT? Why, why spend all that time? You can, yeah, yeah, you can, right? And, and now I'm, just, I'm kidding, by the way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, oh, no, I, you know, and you can do things like, uh, you know, I, I do things like the last, uh, uh, you know, th this company, uh, can you, the last uh, three the th last three revenue misses they had, what were the reasons, right? And you can, it, Copilot will do that. ChatGPT won't do it as, as, as much. It, Copilot, a little bit better there. And, um, and so you can get some of those answers, but at the end of the day, it's, it's drilling in. So uh, one of the, one of the, early deals I want. I, I, I went to a conference. I used to go to conferences a lot. Went to a, a biotechnology conference and they had a bunch of manufacturing people talking about their supply chain and how things are working. And one guy was saying, telling the story about how uh, he has a system that he uses to track all of his material at all of his contract manufacturers and at the 3PL and updating inventory, updating production, and at the end of the speech, I thought, you know, this guy raised his hand, it must have been a thousand people in the room. And he said, what software company sold you that? And the guy said, oh, no, you misunderstand. This is in Excel. And within two years, I got an article published in Pharmaceutical Processing Magazine uh, about a fictitious company that operates their supply chain just like this, this organization did. And I, we built... Uh, basically integrations, uh, data file, which is basically taking data files and marrying them up to the system to so that contract manufacturer can push out and say, I received this much material, the atom number, the bill of lading, the lot number, the quantity, right? And then we consume that to say, now the inventory is now you know, shipped from the supplier to the contract manufacturer. They own it. Now I know it's resident at the, at the facility. I'm going to issue a production job. And then, so we're pulling all that back and forth. So I wrote this article and it gets published. And I went to a company that no longer exists. They got acquired by Pfizer or somebody, and it was uh, Salix Pharmaceuticals. So I read their annual report. In their annual report, they identify all of their contract manufacturers. So in the supply chain demo, I got up there and drew out their supply chain. And the supply chain director said, how do you know that? <laughs> he had no idea that it was in the annual report. So we obviously won that deal. So I think what what you're you're describing all the qualities to a T, but another one you're describing, and I'm saying this for everyone to take note, is expertise. Customers are buying from the partner that they think understands the most about their business because that partner is viewed as a trusted advisor. And I'm seeing that with the way you publish articles, the way you 
go to conferences, the way you're reading their annual report is a genuine desire to be an expert to differentiate. Right. I love it. So let's get into your accounts, your territory. Talk to me about kind of how many accounts you have, how big they are to be able to sell $28 million in, in a year. Yeah. So the landscape's always shifting for us. Um, every year there's something different. Uh, this year I'm in a uh, dedicated to a different industry. You know, you have to be dynamic. You have to be able to be flexible. I spent many years focusing on indus industrials and life sciences and this year I'm in business professional services because I killed it last year in business professional services. They said, you really need to be here and we have a gap. So, um, so it's, um, I, I don't, I have a national kind of responsibility uh, for an industry and for a product uh, and which is finance and supply chain uh, and the ERP products of Microsoft. And that casts off a whole bunch of other work. Uh, and we also have a tight connection to PE firms. So uh, understanding when companies are being carved out. So I've, my biggest deals, my eight figure deals are all PE carve outs. What does so, that mean? Like a PE carve out? A private equity firm is going to buy a, a company, right? Or they're going to split off a piece of a company. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one I did was when Pitney Bowes split off their mail sorting division. Mm -hmm. So it was a Thursday. I'm in Colorado at a demo. I step out. I'm in the parking lot in my car. And with a call with a PE firm, nobody else was going to take that. Somehow it got to me. So I explained to the, these PE guys are pretty serious folks. I spent an hour with them telling them how the system worked. And another reason why to know your system, right? What its capabilities are. And they said, well, you know, we're closing on the acquisition in two weeks. Uh, what do we do next? I said, I will be there Tuesday. We showed up Tuesday with everybody. And we stayed there, didn't leave for two weeks until we could hammer out what the plan was. And we deployed 17 countries with 1500 users across, uh, you know, all these divisions and, you know, just crazy, crazy hard work. Um, I, one last year, another PE carve out uh, and that, um, that uh, was a carve out of a larger corporation, 5,000 users. Uh, they're splitting a commercial vision division from a, from a, from a retail division. And uh, the, Commercial division was being split out. They've got uh, the same needs, uh, basically ERP, a services business. Uh, so they had field service, they had customer service requirements, and then the inventory, warehousing, all of that. And um, again, just go all in to win it. I, I feel like you're not like the typical seller that I meet with and, and talk to. I feel like you're like a project lead or a director, someone leading the team. And it feels to me, just based on how you're answering the questions, like you're all business when you're with the client and the business is execution. What's the plan? How are we going to make this work? Here's what we need. Do I have a good read on that? Not a lot of selling, more execution. And, and yes. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I do a little selling. I mean, I, I um, actually do. Uh, the, the selling that I do is, is a couple of things. One is competitive. Right. The, the implementation team, the pre-sales team aren't going to be competitive. They're not going to analyze the competition. They're not going to know what their strengths and weaknesses are and what their price points are and, and what their weaknesses are to sell against those. So that's really where I'm at with with, quote, selling. Mm -hmm. um, I do sell uh, versus the competition when it comes to selling against their weaknesses uh, and knowing what they are. I, I could pick apart every competitor I have uh, knowing what their weaknesses are. And I pointed out to them in different ways. You got some big ones too. You got the Deloitte's and the Accenture's and the PWC's of the world. I mean, you got Yeah, well, I have two competitors, uh, two kinds of competitors. I've got Oracle, SAP, uh, Infor, and the other ERP systems. And I've also got Accenture, right? Because um, you're, resell you're reselling this stuff too. Right, so I'm, I have implementation competitors and I have software competitors. Yeah, I love it. So looking at, again, some of these projects, your new logo, you got new territory. We're doing what's called prospecting to power right now, which is um, a module on how to get to executives. I'm curious kind of what your prospecting approach is when you get a new patch in the be beginning of the year, they hand you a massive quota. How are you thinking about creating a point of view or who you're prospecting into or who, even who you, you know, what companies you target? Give me kind of your your prospecting strategy your first month when you get a new assignment, new territory, beginning of the year? Yeah, well, I think it comes down to a couple of things. One is you have to know where your, your leads are going to come from. Uh, in my business, uh, we don't 
knock on the door of a, C, C, of a CFO, open the bag and say, I have a new one. Would you like to buy it? ERP is decided upon probably two years before you're ever engaged, right? Uh, the board's involved. Uh, it's, it's not a project you create or an idea that you give. Uh, you're there at the right place at the right time and just execute well. So uh, what I do is really, it's all about how big is my social fabric uh, the, and the lead sources. So I work at a company that has 17,000 employees. So there are a lot of people who can refer me. They know a lot. We have, as you can imagine, hundreds of thousands, 100,000 clients more, right? So they're, they're, they're going to have, you're going to, I build relationships with them as many people in my, in my organization as I possibly can, not in my practice, but in the organization, people who touch those clients who may not, it may be a, a tax client or it may be a, a manage, manage, management consulting client, whomever. whomever so RSM for everyone listening has other divisions where, you know, especially in the partner ecosystem, they might have an accounting practice and you're talking about that group within your company. Right. right. And then the other side of that is Microsoft, right? They're my bread and butter. So I am, so what we do is uh, we uh, spend a lot of time. I fly around to meet with uh, the uh, Microsoft sellers. Uh, they have lists of accounts that they're pursuing. Uh, there's different segmentation, small, medium, large, large enterprise. So I'm going to focus at the large and large enterprise level. And I'm going to work with those sellers to help them make their quota. So I'm going to bounce their list against our customer, our client list, tell them who we know, uh, how we can help them because the, everybody's going to these people saying, can you give me a lead? Mm -hmm. What I'm doing is I'm going to them and saying, I can help you with this account because I know these people. And then we build a plan specifically around that account. So these enterprise sellers only have 20 accounts. So they, they need help, right. To get access. So that's really how uh, we generate, I generate leads. To your talk track to the AEs, you find the, the strategic um, large enterprise AEs and you say, let's see who RSM is working with. And do you come and say, hey, they could use these services or how do you help them sell um, Microsoft products and services into the account? You know, are you, are they pitching it? Are you bringing them in? What does that process look like with the co-selling model? Yeah, um, it's a, it, it's very, very variable, right? The, the seller at Microsoft might have um, an in, they might not, they might rely on us to have that in. So, if, you know, we're doing, uh, we can't sell ERP to auto clients, but uh, because of the uh, SEC rules, yep. but um, you know, we're doing tax, we're doing, we have some, especially at a company like RSM, right? We're number four, we're number five behind the big four. Mm -hmm. So we've got lots of relationships with a lot of executives and we can lever that, right? We got a tax guy who's working with a controller, CFO, VP of finance, whomever it might be. So we can get a warm intro for Microsoft uh, and, and Microsoft uh, has developed a kind of a new strategy around power platform, uh, being able to essentially get into accounts that are running SAP. And, you know, companies hold on to their ERP systems for 20 years. So there's no breaking down the door and get, getting rid of SAP, right? It's never gonna happen. So we need other things to sell. Uh, companies who have 100,000 employees, they need a new time entry. Uh, and there's always all these old legacy systems that need to be retired. And so we can deploy a, you know, a time entry system on, on power apps for a hundred thousand people. It'll cost 5 million, 6 million in software, uh, which we get a percentage of and, um, uh, two, 3 million in services. And, you know, there you go. Mm -hmm. So it's always looking for an angle, uh, in a white space that has opportunity. I love it. And, and talk to me about these, these deals. So you, you kind of rattle off five or 6 million, like it's, you know, couch, couch change, chump change. Yeah. <laughs> I, these are big deals. What, what does the decision process typically look like in terms of having an executive sponsor? Maybe not the ERP one. Cause you said, well, ERP is decided two years before we even get involved. They're already going, but for the everyday business application, power apps, other you know, platforms. Yeah. What, what does that process look like when you're selling these, these massive deals? How many people need to get involved? How long does it typically take in, in your experience? Yeah, it, it can range from um, five to 30 people on each side. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a believer in uh, uh, identifying and winning over a coach to gain access. It's like key to the master key to the company. 
to the prospect. Uh, my view is the CFO will never trust me. Uh, and whatever I tell him, he won't believe or her. And what I need is a coach and who can support me uh, to uh, do all the right things, follow all the right steps, meet all the right people and gain support. You have to, I feel like I have to earn in until I, uh, I don't, I don't, I, well, I ha have done some deals where I've gone top down um, and it's worked well. Uh, it still takes a lot of time. Uh, I've my, one of my biggest deals early on uh, was a uh, six, a $3 billion pharmaceutical company uh, where taking my pitch around this whole outsourcing integration and uh, that company read the article uh, and brought me in. But at the same time, I had a personal friend in the business who uh, his wife worked for the CEO. Mm -hmm. So basically we managed that and we, we went top down. And the, after the IT meeting, we said, we're going to go meet with Tom. And they're like, you know, he's seven levels up. And like, what? <laughs> they, were, they were shocked, right? But we went in, I told them what we're doing, got a support. A year later, we won the business, right? But um, I believe 99% of the time, I need the coach to trust me, to be my advocate, to tell the CFO, CEO, that these are good guys and we should trust them and we should do business with them. Who are these coaches typically? Where do they sit within the org? Is it VP level, SVP usually? Where do you typically see the the coaches that have influence power of the executives yeah depending on the size of the organization often it's not the c level it's somebody who is um well, let's just say a director level uh in the it organization um generally the business uh people aren't the buyers in tech right it's it's technology folks so uh making sure that they get everything they want. I, you know, I want to hear about all their burn victim stories and why projects failed. And, and, you know, a lot of it's time, it's, it's just uh, change management, right? The, the company couldn't absorb uh, or they couldn't, you know, believe they could run the business on the new system. So the project fails. Mm -hmm. So I want to gather all that information, make them feel like I'm there to heal them and not, you know, cross over those same, same wounds. And, uh, you know, get them to believe that, you know, we are the right organization for them and they're going to promote promote us up and we're going to continue to get promoted up. So after we get hit that promotion to the C-level executive, the CIO, whoever it might be, then we're going to win that person. Then we're going to get promoted to the CFO. And when we win that person, we're going to get promoted to the CEO. And that's the approach. When you get promoted, are you meeting with that person directly or are they selling on yes. your behalf? Right. They, they advocate for a meeting with the next level up. Yeah. So that's a big point for everyone listening. You know, you're dealing with a coach, champion, mobilizer, you name it, whatever you want to call it, when they can get you access to power. It's not necessarily that they're the decision maker, but if they're willing to advocate for you and can get the ears of the key decision makers to bring you in, so a VP of applications bringing you to a CIO or a CISO or whatever, and then that person bringing you to a CFO um, is is a good good sign. In, in When you're getting promoted up, I'm curious on, on this term promoted up, Let's say you get to a CIO. CIO says, "Yeah, I like RSM." Is the CIO then bringing you into the CFO, or are they advocating right. it on your behalf? Are you still are you still now meeting with that CFO? In the CIO now is in the room endorsing. Oh, yeah, definitely, right, definitely. He, he, uh, he's in the room. Yeah. yeah so, so it's just the meeting. The meetings get bigger and more important. You're activating champions at each promotion level. Right. And what's the kind of mechanics on how you do that? Do you do you tell the CIO or do you ask the CIO who who else needs to see this? And will you bring us in? And do you ever get resistance in that kind of intro where they're trying to sell it without you in the room? Oh yeah, absolutely. There's all there's always resistance. People are are and unless you win them over, right? They're they, I mean, their job's on the line with these projects, right? There's many, many bodies by the side of the road with project failures. And so it's it's really listening all the way along up that food chain on um, you know, what their concerns are. It's not starting at the happy path. And, and you know, let's tell you, let's, let's look at the ROI and tell you how much money you're going to save. Well, yeah, that's okay. And I think boards sometimes want to see that. Uh, and if you don't do it, you get to the end and the board says, well, why should we do this? And you haven't done the justification. That's problematic, but it's not, the, it's only removing a roadblock. It's not winning. And it's really that uh, getting that trusted advisor level status at each level you're going up and you know making it personal making sure that you, they feel like you are going to 
cover them. You're not going to burn them. If you're getting pushed back and you see a skeptic that says, yeah, we're not convinced, or you're getting a sense that they're not going to promote you up to the next level, what kind of questions do you ask or what's your general approach to challenging that customer to uncover what the real concerns are? Yeah, yeah. One of the uh, pieces of advice I give to everybody interviewing uh, for a sales job is that if you don't close at the end of the interview, if you don't say, do I have your support for this role? You're making a big mistake. You have to ask that question. I have done it every time. I learned that a long time ago. And one job that I, I, I did get when I you know asked the question of the global CIO at Infor, I said, do I have your support for the role? And he said, nah, I don't know. You kind of live far away from an airport. <laughs> and I said, I live 45 minutes from Manchester airport. And he said, oh, I didn't realize that. You know, so you could imagine I could have left that call and with him having doubts about my location being an hour and a half from Boston instead of 45 minutes from Manchester and, and lose, right? So I asked those questions, I probe, you know, why, why not, why not, why not? You know, what are your concerns? You know, how can we answer all your so, questions? It's so obvious and it's not easy because it takes belief in yourself. I mean, I mean it. I, I mean it. This, this What makes great sellers is the opposite of what you think. It's not trying to sell. It's trying to help and have real direct conversations. And to me, it's very obvious to say, do we have your support? If not, why not? What do, What's going on? I'm sensing something. And if you're self-assured and you know your worth and you know your value, you're gonna not have a problem doing that. Right, and, and you pick everyone apart. So uh, if you can get to that place where you do understand that their concerns, you go after every single concern and build a whole strategy around that concern to back, back yourself up and then you differentiate as the person who listened and had a plan around their concerns and that's what wins the business yeah i had a deal one time where uh they had a couple of concerns that uh, uh one that uh we uh the firm i was working for wasn't um uh was failing on projects uh and that uh we weren't trusted by microsoft and there was something else uh, i can't remember and so i had somebody from microsoft write them an email to say, these are good guys. This You should do, definitely do business with them. Uh, cancel that out. Another one where we failed, pro, you know, failed projects. The company that was telling me that, we had done seven or eight saves of projects that they'd failed on. So I lined those up and to you know just really, really aggressively go after every objection. Yeah, makes sense. Um, I want to open it up for questions from the group in a minute. So guys, get your questions for Mike. I know there's going to be a lot of them, so you can start raising your hand. I just have one or two last minute um, wrap ups. So first and foremost, um, you said your win rate is 75%. And I'm just, we've already touched on this, but that still is crazy high. Um, why do you think you win such a high percentage of the deals you go after? Right? Because I walk away from all the deals I'm gonna lose. Okay, well, what does that mean? How do you know? I'm not you're optimistic, gonna... right? I, I don't you leave walk, anything. You walk changed. away, so there you're not, Tell me what, how do you know a deal is going to lose? And at what point in the stage do you walk away? I, lo I love that. Oh, right in the beginning. And, and then uh, when I mitigate, so I'm, so I'll give you an example. Uh, we had a, uh, a, a new prospect in an industry we've never been in before. And I see, I see that as a risk. We don't have any references in that industry. And I, I was on the call with the, with the uh, CFO of this $400 million company. And I told him on the on the first call, I said we have uh, we have not implemented in not for profit before, and I just need to let you know when we get to the point of references, I cannot give you a not for profit reference. That person liked RSM, so we had a leg up, and they really wanted us because we were doing business with them in other areas, and so you know they still wanted us to engage. We got through all the discoveries and the demos, and we sat through the demo eight hours of demo. After the demo was over, the CFO said, great, this is a great demo. I just need three references and not-for-profit. I literally just popped up out of my chair and I pointed at him because I was, at that point I was pissed. <laughs> I said, you told me I didn't need to do that. And he said, oh yeah, you're right. Right, if I had just caved in and oh, well, you're right. We don't have those, easily lose. But I held, I held up to you ability. Win it? Did you win it or did that come out? Like okay, so they, they yeah, became absolutely. the first. You lean into it. <laughs> right. I love it. So you don't need that, but you qualified that up front to make sure the thing that you were doubtful about is not Price, a requirement. References, industry, right? Competitors, all of it. 
So don't chase deals that you know you can't win. And the deals you can't win are the ones where they won't give you access to power and they won't go through your process of proper discovery. Those are kind of the, the tell. Yeah, oh yeah. Uh, when somebody tells me they want a demo next week and on my first phone call, that's pretty much my exit. <laughs> they want a demo after the first phone call? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a good sell. Yeah. We don't know anything about your business, but show me your products. Oh, which one? one which one of 1,000 do you want to see, right? It's it's a little difficult. Um, let's let's go off. Uh, last question, and then we'll get to Josh. Josh's question first. I see a few in the chat. Also, please raise your hand, and I'll get you live so we can get you guys on camera as well asking the questions. So uh, my last question is, you are it seemed to be continually getting better every year. What are you doing to develop yourself and stay sharp? even though you're kind of at this pinnacle of, of sales success, what do you do to develop yourself in an ongoing basis? Yeah, uh, well, at this point, I've, I've only got a couple of years left in this business, uh, probably two. So I, I uh, you know, it's always just kind of continuing to uh, push to be the best and, uh, you know, just zero tolerance for weaknesses or failures. And, and, and my team, my, my social fabric is bigger. It constantly gets bigger. I know more people, uh, I can, you know, I have a close trusted team. That team gets better. Uh, we learn every day. Uh, we, we follow up on our mistakes. Uh, and, you know, I'll give you an example of, of you know, uh, sometimes I will just qualify out because I don't want to chase it because I think it's going to be too difficult. I'm not going to get the buy-in from the delivery team. A uh, couple months, six months later, their a little uh, utilization is low and they want to get aggressive. I would chase that same deal but I'm going to force everybody to the table to be really aggressive and do a lot more work and work harder. So that's really the, the key. I love it, man. I'm going to read off some of the questions in the chat. The first one is Gerald Leverett. He wants to know if you have any outbound strategy or if it's purely inbound, because you talked a lot about networking or people bringing you in and your strategy is to connect your prospecting is basically prospecting to Microsoft and other folks in the RSM ecosystem. So they bring you in, or do you actually ever go out with like a point of view and say, Hey, here's how we can help you and be proactive and bringing a new idea to a client as a way to um, drive success. Yeah. My outbound is with influencers, mm -hmm. not with the buyers. So people who are going to influence the, the ultimate buyer to bring us in. So whether it's in, internal RSM or it's Microsoft or it's consultants who are in the industry, uh, I've got great relations with other competitors in our group, uh, in our space who are generally smaller. Uh, and they don't have the capacity or the or the product capability to deliver. So influencers is the biggest. Factor. How people bring you in? Make That's my outbound, them. right? It's kind of like my affiliate marketing program. You know, have all the people in this program sell to people and their peers or the, their leaders and leverage them. We do all inbound as well. So I, I like the approach, but you're still prospecting. You're just prospecting the people who can bring you in. It's just a different type of prospect. Yeah. And, you know, the world's changed. I mean, email, phone calls, they just don't work anymore. People don't pick up the phone. They don't reply to emails. You, your email gets blocked when you're pitching somebody on a cold. I mean, in Canada, you can't even send a cold email. You know, it's just against the law. So yeah. how do you reach yeah, out? We're seeing stuff go to spam all the time. We're talking about that. You can't rely right. on email alone and in phone, unless you have their cell phone, right? And it's even harder. So we're saying send send voice notes via text so that they can get access, send videos because you have to stand out and that's that's timely. But the number one approach is always go to your network, right? Always see who can walk you in. Who do you know that can make an introduction to you? Right, so the answer to your question is make my network bigger. That's how I continue to improve. I love it. Um, how many accounts do you have? Do you cover the whole country for your product or is it unlimited or do you yeah, have a yeah, unlimited. territory? Unlimited. So it's not a set territory. Um, Jared's asking, when you have a moment, can you elaborate how you go about picking apart competitors? What's your approach to that? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, it comes over time. Uh, I'll, you know, I, I hope there's no NetSuite sellers on the call, but um, oftentimes we compete against NetSuite. Uh, and I will collect as much information as I possibly can about NetSuite. And um, I'll give you an example. Uh, you know, I know their pricing. Um, there was a time when Oracle and SAP used to publish their pricing online. Microsoft does, so I know what their what their what their pricing is. So I will uh, position even you know. So we don't discount a lot on software. Microsoft uh, pr list price is pretty low, so I know that NetSuite's price is almost double, but they can discount. Uh, but my strategy is. 
is I and they have lots of SKUs. Microsoft sells by the user. There's like seven pages of SKUs on a NetSuite invoice for a even a smallish company. And so I make sure that the prospect knows having selling enterprise software for so long, they, most companies don't see that invoice until they've agreed to buy. They see this one line item, then they get the invoice and it's seven lines. And I said, what does that mean? You have to look at the, get a in, pro forma invoice for the, for the list price and the discounted price because it's a term and it's going to expire and that's your year three price. So I try to neutralize, you know, and that's an example of neutralizing the competitor on price making sure that they know year four and five, it's going to be far more than they expect. And just knowing how they structure their contracts and where the, right. where, the where the gotchas are. Um, any right. other, any yeah. other competitive advice without calling the competitor ugly or bashing them? Any, any yeah, that's not a bash. I mean, it's just that, you know, they're, they're, it's their situation, right? That's, you know, they, they have a complex price book and it is what it is. Um, you know, on the other side of that, uh, you know, there's competitors out there that are in the mid market that we, I know I've lost to them three or four times, right? So I don't even want to compete with them anymore because I know that we just can't, we, we can't get down to that level. Mm -hmm. uh, but if I'm forced, right, to say, you know, you, we really want to win this deal, then I am, we need to do something very unique to win. We can't do the same old playbook. And that's, you know, generally, you know, what we have to do, um, you know, knowing where they come in on price, knowing what their strengths and weaknesses are, uh, there's a lot of great companies out there, and a lot of great software, and NetSuite fits better than Microsoft and some companies than 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 others, right? So there's you know there's a place for everybody. Uh, it's just making sure that the place you're in and selling to the prospect you have uh, is you know th they're aware of it. And I'll give you another example. Uh, you know, there's difference in, in the ERP space. There's a difference between monitoring and control. This is one of my pitches here. Is like, do you want a system that only tells you when something bad happens or do you want a system that's going to stop it from happening mm -hmm. right and th and there's differences in systems that will do that and so that's what i so i get under the covers and get in their head to make sure they really understand what they're buying yeah i love it you just have to know the competition shortfalls weaknesses what it does what it doesn't better than anyone and you you do and clearly you enjoy it too you like that competitive win um josh horgan's asking what books would you recommend to read well, uh, you know, being being adept at business, number one, right? Just, you know, understanding how businesses operate, you know, how they, uh, you know, understanding what the key metrics are, you know, DSO, Dale Sales Outstanding, you know, being able to talk to a CFO, you know, what, what's your biggest issue? How do I, how do I help you with your DSO? It can mean millions to them, right? And if you can fix that, then they're more like, likely to listen to you. Do you just ask that question? What's the biggest problem you're facing you're trying to fix right now? Or how do, do you do right. research to uncover that beforehand with your people? Well, I try to read it in the annual report mm -hmm. and then try to pick out where they stand versus their competitors. And I might mention it to them that, you know, based on your annual report, you know, you're in comparison to your peers, you're not doing as well in this area. Would you like to elaborate? One of the books, what are some good business books that you've recommended or? or uh, you know, I, I dumb it down. Really, I mean, ERP for dummies or, you know, whatever, right? Whatever, whatever industry or product you're selling, uh, you don't need to be the expert. You just need to have, you know, a, a couple questions deep, right? You, not, not the expert, but not, you know, only one layer deep. If you want, if anyone wants a good book for um, understanding general business acumen and terms like day sales outstanding, uh, read the book. It's by Ram Sharon called What the CEO Wants You to Know. Isaac, if you want to put a link to that in the chat, what the CEO, it's all the basic operations and runnings of a business and how to speak business, financial and understanding the different terms and EBITDA and any of these kind of things you might hear and come across. Um, I think we're close to getting through all the questions. The next one is from Cole uh, Neinstedt. He says, is there anything you do when you're in the midst of a deal and it loses velocity. Maybe one team within the company isn't communicating or a key stakeholder isn't attending the meetings, et cetera. So how do you keep momentum on a deal when it starts stalling? Well, it you know certainly should never happen on our side. Uh, you know, one of my key key factors is to reply immediately, follow up, you never be critical path. No one, no prospect should ever be waiting on you. Uh, as far as the prospect goes, a lot of times you can't control it. I want to. $8 million deal last year. 
where uh, I qualified on price. We did demonstrations uh, and they disappeared for three months. Mm -hmm. there, everybody wants a competitive bid. And when he came back to me three months later, he said, is it really going to be 19,000 hours? And I said, well, why don't we show up on site and figure it out? And I think pressing the flesh is critical. Showing up with the team, meeting executives, and you know, forcing that kind of conversation is the only way to get around you know, these big numbers that people don't want to buy. And, um, and they, if you can convince them that it's in their best interest to buy it, that's the key. What did you do during the three months of waiting? Not much you can do. Work on other deals. How were you feeling though? Were you anxious or were you a little stressed or were you just- You know, like I'm always trying to keep my pipeline big enough that, you know, if, if one if one slows or one fails, you, you know, you just move on. So you remain stoic AF. <laughs> <laughs> Not exactly. I, 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 mean, I mean, it's out of your control, right? It's like, I'm going to keep doing other work on other deals versus going crazy, circling and annoying them and possibly- No, I get, don't annoy them. <laughs> <laughs> looking desperate look desperate right yeah exactly you don't want that commission breath um last question we are right at the hour so timed it really well uh appreciate you coming on mike um where can people connect or learn more from you or is there any resources that you know because you're a wealth of knowledge we don't want to keep you hidden away in in the underbelly of rsm any any place you know to continue I mean, you can connect with me on LinkedIn if you'd like, um, or, you know, through, through you, Ian, you know, if you'd like to, you know, do something there, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm out there on LinkedIn, Michael, Michael Webster at RSM. I love it. I love it. And and the last thing is uh, you're mentoring now. What got you into kind of mentoring and coaching within RSM? What drove that for you? Knowing so, you're a, you're an accomplished yeah. seller and this is a different, you know, a different motivation. It feels like. Yeah. So I've uh, done, uh, w two seven figures multiple years in a row, uh, and congratulations. And I feel very reverent for the the good fortune that the organization has provided to me. Uh, I do not believe I own territory. I don't believe I own accounts. It's all the firm's business. I am just at you know I, it's my luxury to be there. So I wanted to give back. Uh, we've got a team that's more senior and going to retire in a couple of years. Uh, and I wanted to help my firm generate a whole new generation of sellers. And it's very difficult to do what we do. So the only way we could do that is help try to compress the learning curve, right? With everything we've learned. And we just got out of a two-day session with a bunch of senior sellers just drilling Daniel and the rest of the team. Drill them away. I've been drilling for two years. So the more drilling, the better. It's a different skill set, Mike. It is. It's a it's a thoroughness. It's a patience. It's a project management skill set. It's a direct and really in service. I mean, you you embody that, and that's what I want everyone to walk away with is what you think makes a great seller is not always what makes a great seller. In fact, it's usually not. What makes a great seller is caring for the client, being thorough, being direct, walking away, knowing your worth. And, and genuinely trying trying to help um, your customer achieve their desired outcomes. People don't buy from people they like. They buy from people they trust. Amen to that. Well, I trust you, my man. And I trust that we will be doing some big things together in the future. And in and, and our joint goal of mentoring and helping sellers up level how they show up. And you're living it. Appreciate you. We'll get this published next week. And um, let's all give uh, Mike a round of applause and thank him for coming on, sharing his wisdom, and he's the real deal. So connect with Mike and hope everyone has a wonderful day. We'll see you for next month's Fireside Chat. Take care, Great. everyone. Thank Bye -bye. you, Ian. Yeah.